Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's program is solar eclipse imaging. And here to tell us about what they did and show us the pictures that they took are my three guests for this episode, Scott Shields, Gary Gibson, and Tim Campbell. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to have each of our guests talk about their images and how they went about taking them, their setup and whatnot. And each of them will have a period of time to talk about their adventure. We're going to start out first with Scott Shields. So Scott, tell our audience how you went about setting up for the images, where you were, and then we'll talk about those images. Yeah, we will do. Um... So, to me, this eclipse was really about the weather, right? Where there was not clouds. Um, I had looked at a lot of different locations along the line of the eclipse to, to, to choose from, and I picked out a lot of different parks, and I wasn't sure exactly where I was going to go. Um, I ended up going down south of Indianapolis, which it looked like from the weather report was going to have some clear skies. So, I went down to Lake Monroe, which is just south, a little bit west of uh, Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. um, Got a nice spot down there. A friend of mine went down there. A friend of mine and I went down there. Uh, we stayed in Louisville the night before so that we were right close to the location. Um, we drove there the next morning. We were there very early. <laughs> we wanted to avoid all the traffic. So we got sure, there about sure. 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, and we just picked out our spot and we just waited and waited and waited. So we set up our equipment right on the shoreline of this Lake Monroe, um, which I'd never been to before, but it was a really nice place. Um, and the equipment that I used was a, a Sony a digital camera, right, a, a, A7R3, uh, with a 600 millimeter lens. And it was set up on my uh, star tracker. So um, I was able to solar align, daytime solar align, which was a real challenge, something I'd practiced, but uh, it still is a real challenge. Uh, and then track the shots that I got. So um, yeah, then it was just a waiting game till, till the total eclipse. Till showtime. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. So, so yeah, let's uh, take a look at some of your images. Okay. Yeah, this one is just, uh, just after totality, so C2. Um, yeah, uh, again, taken with a 600 millimeter lens. Um, I did bracket these shots, was, which was quite a challenge. Um, my camera, I set it up for three different modes. One was uh, pre-totality, basically partial of, between C1 and C2. One was for right at C2 and C3, and then one setting was just for totality. Um, so I just had changed different modes on my camera, real simple setup. And then once I got to totality, I did uh, nine shot brackets, two sets of nine shot brackets. Uh, so I didn't have to keep fiddling with the camera all the way through, and then combine them in Photoshop. So this, this image here is probably one of my favorites because I really got the earth shine uh, back on the moon. This is probably an oh. eight eight second shot uh, from that setup. So this was one of the goals that I really wanted to get to was to, to grab this shot and get yeah, that Normally you light. don't see that earth sh shine shot. So that's, that's quite unique. Yeah, so this is a single frame of, of all those frames I put together. This is the entire thing put together with that earth shine as well as the corona shown. Um, a little bit of prominence is there as well. Oh so, yeah, you can pick them up there, one yeah, at the bottom, another yeah, one towards yeah. the top. So again, this is 17 stops of photography, if you're familiar with photography, right? Each stop okay. doubles the amount of light that you gather. So, oh, sure. Yeah, so some of these are ranging from one eight thousandth of a second all the way up to eight seconds. So all combined into one shot. And then, of course, things have to end, right? So here's uh, C3. Sad but true, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it kind of surprised me when it happened. It ended, it ended much quicker than I expected. It kind of lost track of time. Um, but yeah, here's this, uh, the sun starting to emerge on the other side getting a little bit of diamond ring as well as the corona. Again, this is a single frame, and then I did one with combining different frames, so I get a little bit of that earth shine uh, in the moonshot as well. And then finally, you know, the end of, end of C3, so sun starts to reveal itself again, or the moon reveals the sun, and uh, we get some really nice uh, uh, shot there. A little bit of prominences. The thing that surprised me about this was I really kind of lost focus, and I guess it's because of the temperature drop. 
right? Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. So um, so I, I really realized that through those images, the, the focus was lost a little bit. And my assumption is because the, the temperature dropped and the lens cooled down, right, from where it was. Oh, so. well, she, yeah, even though it's just a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, it's surprising. You, you could feel the temperature. You could feel it get cooler. I mean, all those things they talked about exactly. for the eclipse. It was, uh, yeah. It Did was you very do much uh, post-processing then on these images? Yeah, quite a bit, quite a bit. Combining mm -hmm. the images, I used Photoshop to align the images so all the suns were aligned together in the 17 shots, and then just blending them together to get the best parts of, of all the pictures. So a, a median blend and then just some final work to bring out that little bit of detail in the corona and some in the moonshine as well, So exactly. or earthshine, sorry. So then you were fairly close then to the, uh, the center line of, of totality? Yeah, we were uh, about 10 miles off the, the center miles. line, so not, not too far off, so, so as I recall. So about three minutes or so? Of, uh... Yep, yep. Each one of those sets of 16 or 17 pictures took about 16 seconds, so I could run through them fairly quickly, and then I still had time to actually enjoy the, the eclipse itself and actually view it and see it. I wasn't stuck behind the camera the whole time as exactly. well. Exactly, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was nice. So my friend and I got to enjoy it, and uh, yeah, we stayed in Louisville again that night, and uh, then drove home the next day. So it was nice. Avoided the parking Avoided lot. Avoided <laughs> yeah, which was all the I traffic. And, yes. Yeah, yeah. Indeed, yeah. No, those are uh, really some interesting, interesting photos, especially like the the Earth shine. That's uh, I don't recall ever seeing that before. But uh, yeah, I I had seen it in an image, and I really that was kind of my aspiration. I really wanted to get that if I could. Okay. Um, so I read up on as much as I could. I tried to uh, figure out how to do that and how to set it up. And the, the key, I think, was to make the camera settings uh, as simple as possible. So. Exactly. You don't want to be fidgeting with it. Just let it do it. Changing thing. it for 17 shots just wouldn't have worked. No, wouldn't have that's worked. for sure. That's for sure. Well, I, those are some great images and, and a great story about how you acquired them all. Next, we'll go to uh, Gary Gibson. Gary. Hi, Don. Well, I, didn't, I don't have fancy equipment. I have some uh, older telescopes that I like to use at many outreach events during the days to uh, look at the sun. Uh, one has a solar projection um, system on it where you project the sun onto a screen and you can see sunspots or you can see the eclipse. Uh, the other scope has a, uh, a white light filter and uh, I made those filters. Okay. I made the filter. And these are the, the and, scopes right here on the... And, and those are the scopes. Uh, the, the one on the left is uh, doing the solar projection, and it's got a, a 60 millimeter uh, telescope with only 700 millimeter focal length. It's a, through an eyepiece. The scope on the right is a, a, a 80 millimeter by 910, and I had the uh, Bader film on that one. And I wasn't... I had to stay at home, and I really wasn't planning on doing anything for the uh, eclipse. But when I got up, it was a ni nice day, and an hour before I set it all, I set everything up. I just happened to take a, a photograph of the sun with my phone, to because there was a sunspot right in the middle, and I looked at it. And said, wow, that came out pretty good. So okay. when and this the clip, was the setup that you used, to yes. So okay. I, I just held my camera phone to the eyepiece and snapped a picture. And, and then as the clip started, you know, first contact, is that C1? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That at about 2 o'clock, I took the first photograph. And then from there on, I ended up taking about 16 photographs, and I ended up making a series. And, and it wasn't my initial plan. It just came out that way. And you can see the sunspot in the center. And, and as you could see the, uh, the moon start to make its way across the surface. And, uh, and, and there'll be one picture where I'll have the moon right on one of the sunspots. Okay. And I tried to, and I blew that image up and uh, just to kind of show um, where, well, of course I had some, didn't have some good ones. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, there's the one. You can barely see the sunspot. Actually, it almost looks like a, a solar flare on the moon. Oh, but, wow. But, uh, see, yeah, there it is. And um, How interesting. I just thought it would be cool to do that. Yeah, if you didn't tell me that that was a sunspot, 
I would have thought that that was a flare on the sun. <laughs> That's exactly what it looks like. So, um, so as we kept getting closer to totality, you could see the rotation of the sun as it got close. And there's a couple pictures where you can see the moon actually change direction. Like there's that picture and the next person picture, it's, it's, it's starting to leave the sun. And I made a series of it leaving and I think the last photo was about about 4.30. Okay. And uh, you can even see some, some clouds were starting to uh, come into the view. But there's right, the, the sunspot, sunspot again. Yeah. Yep, <laughs> sunspot shows again. And uh, since I, did, I didn't plan on it, I, I should have planned for a party. And, uh, but I ended up having, you can see last contact. You can see the moon just yeah, leaving. Just a little bit. Yep, just leaving. Perfect. And uh, I had about eight, nine people in my driveway enjoying the, uh, sun, uh, uh, the eclipse. Now, when you took the images using your cell phone, uh, you had some Bader film or something over the lens, or was the filter on the telescope in the front? The, uh, the Bader film was on the end covering the lens. Okay, out front. Okay. Yeah. So... It was a great, it, it came out great. It was yeah, a fun. Sometimes it just the spur of the moment thing works out to be just fine. You know, sometimes we plan and plan and plan as, as amateur astronomers because we want to do it a certain way. And then nature gets in the way and says, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. we've, all, we've all experienced that. So uh, it, it's interesting to see just a very basic setup. So someone does not have to spend a lot of money for, for big equipment or expensive cameras or a lot of other. Yeah, and, and those two telescopes are from the 1960s. Well, there you go. There you yeah. go. Yeah, I remember looking through scopes like that back in the 60s. And uh, yeah, they worked fine then and uh, yeah. they, work, they work fine now. So one of, the, one of the mounts was an old CG5 mount. The other mount was an old Edmund mount. Oh, and and they both okay. track perfectly. So I was surprised at that, too. Yeah, quality, uh, quality merchandise. Uh, <laughs> you take care of stuff, right? And uh, it'll take care of you. Well, this has been great conversation uh, with my first two guests and their experiences with uh, our solar eclipse back in April. And we enjoyed looking at their images. Now, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, if you have a question, uh, please send it to our email address that you see down there at the bottom of your screen. And right after Term of the Month with Stephen, we'll be back with our final guests. So don't go away. Thanks, Don. The Term of the Month is the final parsec problem. When two black holes orbit each other, they spiral towards each other by transferring their orbital energy to other nearby matter. When black holes get to about three light years away from each other, which is one parsec, there isn't enough matter left to continue the process. And that's the problem. Since gravitational wave detectors routinely detect black hole mergers, there must be some process that helps them overcome this last parsec. Many mechanisms have been proposed. For example, a third black hole uh, that introduces chaos to the orbits of all three and the, a merger happens. Or there might be several stars that continuously contribute matter. But this year, 2024, a model of self-interacting dark matter has been shown to extract enough orbital momentum now, not all models of dark matter have dark matter self-interact. It is thought that ongoing experiments in pulsar timing hint at evidence confirming this dark matter behavior. New data may confirm it in the next few years, which would be incredibly exciting. The shapes of galactic dark matter halos is also 
uh, a prediction of this self-interacting dark matter. These results should provide a window into the nature of dark matter. And that is the term of the month, the final Parsec problem. Back to you, Don. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome back. The topic for this month's show is solar system, or solar eclipse imaging, I should say. And uh, we're going to finish up the program with our third guest, Tim Campbell. Tim, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me back. <clears throat> All right, so uh, tell our viewers about your experiences uh, uh, in imaging the solar eclipse. So, yeah, so and as Scott mentioned earlier, you know, it's all about the planning and uh, the best laid plans. And it didn't really work out the way I had planned. Um, I did do a lot of weather research. And I realized that if I went all the way to Texas, um, particularly if I could get southwest of Waco, Texas, uh, the probability of clear skies would be substantially better uh, because I knew April in Michigan not so much. Yeah, you know, four or five days of, of clear, right? And, and most of it's going to be cloudy. So I said, I, I don't think I want to stay up here. I think I want to go all the way down there. Um, we had made arrangements with the, the city of Gatesville, Texas. Um, and uh, it was, they were having a huge event because their town is right on the center line. And so they had planned all this stuff. Uh, I'm a solar system ambassador with NASA, JPL, uh, as is Liam. And both of us were going down there, and uh, we were going to do talks and everything. Liam actually did all that. Uh, but the weather was, in fact, cloudy there. So on my way down, I ended up staying with a friend, personal friend of mine who lives in Dallas, not too far, maybe another hour and a half uh, away. Um, and when the weather was clearly going to be bad the following day, I said, there's, there's just no point in going all the way down. Um, we'll just set up here. And so I took out my equipment and I set it up uh, actually the night before uh, because I was able to just set it up in the backyard and it was clear of trees. And I wanted everything to be nicely polar aligned. Uh, the, the, the rotation of both the telescope, I also had a, uh, a special camera mount with a, it's called a tracking head, but it's tilted so that the, uh, the rotation of this motorized mount is parallel to Earth's rotation of axis, sure. you know, axis, right? So as the Earth spins one way, the camera spins the other way and everything, it just tracks, tracks whatever you want. Um, so all of that was set up uh, the evening before. On the, the, the morning of, the skies looked terrible. In fact, even when uh, the first contact came around, the uh, first contact being when the moon first starts to cover the sun, it hasn't made it to totality yet. Uh, even that um, was mostly cloudy. Occasionally I would get lucky and get a little bit of uh, clear that I could see what was going on, and I thought this is not going to work. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I, you know, I, I set up everything with automated uh, capture software that was just going to automatically time everything, and I said I, I get what I get. Uh, this is what we get. Uh, so with that, um, actually, one of the cameras wanted to misbehave, but I had a um, Canon 5D Mark IV mounted to a, a telescope with roughly a it was a refractor with roughly 500 millimeter focal length. So it'd be like a 500 millimeter lens on a camera. The other one is a uh, Canon 60D-A. It's a special astrophotography edition of the Canon 60D. The filter is replaced for better night sky uh, image response of uh, the reds in hydrogen alpha nebula. Not needed for an eclipse, but that's what I had. That was connected to just a 100 to 400 millimeter lens. Um, and uh, one of them, like I said, didn't, didn't want to cooperate with me, and I said, that's it, you, you know, you take your one shot to fix it during the eclipse. If it's not working, you don't let it ruin the event. So I abandoned that camera and just focused on the other. And so I can show you what I got. All right, let's take a look All at right. those images. So this is the first image um, creeping up on totality. This is actually not quite totality yet, even though it looks like it is. If you look at all of those bright white lights in the upper left uh, around, say, 10, 30, 11 o'clock, um, those are called Bailey's beads. And you get that because the moon is not perfectly smooth. It's got mountains and valleys. And that's the last little bits of sunlight peeking between the gaps in the mountains uh, that come through. That's a difficult shot to time. You have to have the timing just right to be able to nab that. 
Um, and actually, I did some research before the event and tweaked the exposure uh, times a little bit uh, based on assumptions of what they call the solar radius. It's a bit complicated, but if you use the IAU value for the solar radius, which I did in the 2017 eclipse, I missed the shot. Uh, when I tweaked it for the new value that they recommended, I actually got the shot. So I was, I was happy that yeah, I got nice. that. Very nice. Um, and then this is finally now we actually have totality. You can see the corona there. Uh, as Scott was saying, normally you want to bracket this. I did take uh, bracketing through, I think, 12 stops. It might have been 14 stops of exposure. Uh, I'm not really sure. But in there, you can see little bits of red um, peeking through in, in this shot. And those bits of red are actually eruptions uh, on the edge of the sun. That's part of the sun's chromosphere. You don't normally see that um, in visible light. You normally have to use special hydrogen alpha wavelength telescopes to be able to see that. But during an eclipse, you actually can see that. That's actually kind of cool. And then this is, uh, again, this is a shot that I've allowed. Now, this is not a, a combined. Normally, you would take and process these, take many different exposures and put it together. And you can see this is a much longer exposure. Um, near the moon slash sun, is really blown out. You don't see the detail there anymore, but you do see much farther extents on the actual corona itself. Yeah, that's, that's a very nice shot. And if we go on to the next one, um, I love that eruption down around 5 o'clock uh, that you have. Um, this is we're nearing the end. You can see another eruption up around 2.30 um, coming up, but that almost like a nice pointy thing. I did not expect to see that. Uh, this is very close to uh, third contact when the sun is about to reveal again. And if we go on to the last shot, I think there's just one more. And that's, we call that the diamond ring. This is the sun exactly. exposing itself. Um, and if you grab it, you know, just before it can fill out most of it, and you sort of you can see why they call that the diamond ring. This was just a fun shot as I was uh, with my host. Uh, I said, go grab a kitchen calendar and, and bring it outside. Now, this was leading up to totality. This is not during totality. And we took a camera with the, the sun shining through the holes in the calendar through the on spiral. the sidewalk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, you know, whatever partial phase you're in, you see those. They were really surprised to see that effect. Every yeah, you can see is, that too as it shines through leaves. Oh yeah. You get the same effect. Every little hole is like a pinhole camera. You don't actually need a lens. Exactly. Gentlemen, I want to thank you, uh, all for uh, joining me uh, today here to talk about uh, your experiences with the, uh, the solar eclipse and the images that you took. Uh, I was in Rochester, New York on the center line, but I was completely clouded out. So I had three minutes of, of, and 40 seconds of darkness under cloudy skies. So I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be able to see this with you. Uh, if you uh, would like to check out our club website, please do so. Uh, the address, as always, is down at the bottom of your screen. And coming up next to round out our show is What's Up with Stephen. Thanks, Don. What's up in the night sky for August 2024? So uh, we just had the solstice. Uh, the days are changing uh, length uh, faster and faster until we get to the equinox, then they'll slow, slow down again. August starts with a new moon on the 4th. The first quarter is on the 12th, full moon is on the 19th, and the third quarter is on the 26th. On the 1st of August, Mercury and Venus are in the evening sky. This is really about sunset. Uh, and they set about half an hour after sunset. So uh, Mercury sets half an hour um, at, on, uh, at the beginning of the month and rises um, an hour before sunrise by the end of the month. Uh, that's because we have inferior conjunction on the 18th of August. That's when the, the Mercury goes between the sun and the earth. Venus sets also about a half an hour after sunset. Uh, you can see they're real close to each other. That's how it happens. Uh, to an hour after sunset by the end of the month, Venus has a weird orbit. It moves fast. It does weird things. Get, get over it.
Then we have Jupiter, Mars, Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, and Pluto left to right on your screen. So Jupiter rises, Jupiter rises um, five hours after sunset to four hours after sunset over the month. Um, Mars is similar, but rises five hours after sunset to five hours after sunset, and that's because Mars has does weird things as well. Neptune rises two hours after sunset to an hour after sunset, and Saturn rises from about an hour and a half after sunset to about a half an hour after sunset. And then finally, Pluto, um, which I recommend if you have a 13-inch scope, um, sets an hour before sunrise to three and a half hours before sunrise. So you'd, you'd uh, want to wait until the end of the month for that. Now, on this, on this image, we have uh, a note uh, near Saturn, um, the Delta Aquarius meteor shower, the radiant, is in Aquarius next to Saturn there. The peak was July 30th, but it's a soft peak. Watch, uh, to, uh, watch for these meteors till about August 21st. For early August, expect to see meteors from this shower and the Perseid shower. Um, and the, the Perseid shower has a radiant in the upper left-hand corner, up there by the description of Mercury. Um, the peak is on the 12th of the Perseids, and the mornings of the 11th, 10, uh, 12th, and 13th are your best bets. Uh, the Perseids can be seen all month. Note that you don't have to have the radiant visible in order to see meteors for any meteor shower. Also, dress warm, you never know how cold it's going to get. And that's what's up in the night sky for August 2024. Remember, we don't charge money for this show, but we may tax your brain. Mm -hmm.